congregation of St. Agnes or Agnesian sister who lives and works in Catholic Theological Union in Chicago's Hyde Park. We affectionately know and call it um, CTU. Are you hearing me okay, folks? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Welcome to all of you who are joining us. Uh, it looks like so far everyone's in Northeast Ohio and one in Westmont, Illinois tonight so far. Uh, Julie is our person who watches us in our masses from from where? Oh, Westmont, oh. Illinois. Okay. Yeah. So, um, without any further ado, uh, Sister Diane, I meant to ask you: Do you have a prayer? I have a little prayer. I, I meant to even read it last night. Well, why don't you read it if you have one? All right, great. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Restore my strength, O Holy Spirit. Drive away from me all forms of sickness and disease. Restore our strength to our bodies and our spirits during this time of pandemic, so that renewed in health, we may serve you and bless you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Without any further ado, uh, we'll turn it back over to Diane for tonight's second sequence. Thank you so much. Well, it's good to see you all again or to be with you. Um, just take a moment to try to uh, summarize very shortly and succinctly what I said last night because I want to build on it. I think the primary focus of last night, well, first of all, let me say this, the primary focus of all of these talks is the primary focus of the Holy Father's document Laudato Si, and that is that we must look anew at the way we understand what it means to be part of the natural world. It's not simply, we don't know how to talk about it in a certain sense. We don't have language to talk about it, or we're not, we don't, we're not used to having good language. We talk about our relationship with the natural world. We never talk about our relation with our hand. We never talk about our relation, our relationship with our spleen. It's odd because we don't have a relationship. It's us. It's part of us. But we talk about our relationship with the natural world as if, as if it's something other than us. We are a product of the natural world. If you want to know what nature, or if you want to know what earth can produce, look in the mirror. Now it took 4 million years, but that's what earth does in 4 million years. We're looking at it. We are products of this magnificent evolving, and that's not a dirty word, evolving mystery of life. All right, so, in the, and we're not used to talking about it as if it is ours and part of us. Again, I, 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 a little, did I tell you the story about, about uh, Bob uh, uh, Stephanopoulos last night, right? Robert Stephanopoulos, the, uh, the uh, Alaska? All right, well, Robert Stephanopoulos, the father of George Stephanopoulos, he's, uh, he's a priest, uh, and, well, he's a Greek Orthodox priest, but uh, I don't know if you knew he was from here, Orange, Ohio. They were oh, here. well then, okay. Um, uh, he used to be a missionary, or he told a story about a missionary in Alaska. And he, the, the missionary in Alaska was told by one of the natives how sacred it is to hunt, sacred. Now put that aside just a moment. Uh, a colleague of mine, no longer a colleague, he used to teach at CTU, he was an anthropologist, a spiritual priest, his name is Tony Gittins. He said there are three primar primary institutions in human society, three. Everything else is sort of a part of or a break off from. And these three are number one, sex because of life, uh, worship, because of the relationship with God, and the hunt, because of our need to survive. Three primary institutions, all three of which are surrounded 
by significant power. Significant power. We know the power of sex. We know the power that comes from worship. We don't normally think of the power that is associated with the hunt. And this is the story he told, or at least it described. A particular native group, they would have, before they would go, they, they were dependent on the seal. Before they would go on the hunt for the seal, they would have a religious ceremony and ask the spirit of the seal if they would be willing to sacrifice one of their members so that the tribe could survive. So the, again, this, this sounds, I mean, it, it certainly is, is not uh, monotheistic, but just think of the depth of the, of the thinking there. Right? So they asked the seal to offer one of their own for the sake of the tribe. It is an acknowledgement of total dependence on the natural world. That's good theology. That is. The way they do it may not have been, but that's good theology. So then they would go on the hunt. And there is a certain way of killing. If ancient Israel had that. There was a certain way of, of killing an animal for sacrifice. You know, and a, something to do with also within that, what you do with the blood, how you drain the blood. It even got to the point where not everybody could sacrifice. Even today, I believe in Orthodox Jewish societies, you don't sacrifice, you don't, you don't slaughter the animal. There is a special rabbi that slaughters the animal. All right. And the reason is because of the sanctity of blood. Now, all of this, friends, you and I, our ancestors did this, and we have lost it. And I say our ancestors did because you trace it all back, and we all come from maybe millions or you know thousands of years years ago more traditional people, but they recognize, they recognize the sacredness, you know, of, of the natural world, elements in the natural world. They recognized it and they, they, they showed that reverence in worship and in the way they live their lives. So there's a special way to kill the seal. And if you don't kill the seal right, if you do anything wrong, the seal will not allow you the next year to get to be successful in the hunt. They will not release one of their own. So you have to kill the seal right. Then when you bring the seal back, you've got to use every single element within that animal, you waste nothing. So you've got food, you've got oil, you've got fuel, everything has to be used. And what is not used must be gathered together. The offal, you know, the leftover, the, the real waste, and real waste, not the way we raised, but the real waste, had to be brought together and burned. And if they did, if they were not faithful to this, they would not be successful the next year. Now, there are some very profound theological elements in there. And again, I want to say I am not suggesting that we have any kind of, of a pagan tribe, some would say, or traditional tribes. Again, it's, it's the idea of recognizing. And the first thing to recognize is our total dependence on the natural world. I said yesterday, uh, like, well, yeah, it was yesterday. I say it again. Both Lynn White and the Holy Father said, it is essential that we look at our religion in a new way. We look at our religion in a new way. I want to read something relative to that issue. Women and men have always been fascinated by the universe. Poets, dreamers, and mystics of every kind have looked to the heavens in wonder and awe and for inspiration. The magnificence and scope of the universe has transported them to realms of fantasy, and ecstasy alike. This universe has both thrilled them and frightened them. They have traced the positions of the stars and uncovered Orion the hunter. They have recognized the sparks in Thor's hammer in the lightning that streaks through the sky. 
They have been startled by the voice of Yahweh in the thunder that rolls across the heaven. They believe that this is all elements of the God. They've experienced the monthly phases of the moon in the life cycle of women. And just as elements of the heavens were anthropomorphized, which means they were given human characteristics, ascribed with human characteristics, so people's or, uh, understanding of the origin, structure, and makeup and working of the universe have influenced how they, how they perceive human nature with its place and role within that universe, as well as its dignity and its power and control over that universe. Throughout human history of enlightenment, significant revol uh, uh, revolutionary scientific discoveries have forced new cosmological renderings. I mentioned that a little bit last night. And theological rever revisions have followed. We, we as human beings, we as religious beings, have not been, have not welcomed, always have welcomed new scientific insights. We fought them. The church sure has. The church fought evolution. In some circles of the church, it still fights evolution. Pythagoras, if you remember, insisted that the earth is a sphere and not flat. The church fought that. Why? Because it, you know, uh, it had something to do with human dominance. We are dominant on Earth. Darwin's insight into revolution, evolutionary processes disputes the notion of direct creation of humankind. We fought that. Astounding scientific facts have continued to un uncover and corresponding theological reinterpretation repeatedly required. Galileo had to go through the Inquisition. He was found to be heretic. And he made a deal with his, with his, with uh, the judge. Rather than have him killed, he lived in house arrest for the rest of his life. And why? Because he said, the earth goes around the sun. The sun does not go around the earth. All right. So the church fights that. Why? Because and it fights it not because of scientific, but because it, it challenges some of our religious understanding. I mean, there's so much about the makeup of human beings and the way we have we have evolved that evolution challenges. The whole thing about the human soul, if we are evolved out of nature and we're not evolved from monkeys, and if we were, some of them have not yet made the leap. I mean, it's, it's a much more sophisticated than that. Chardin talks about that. And Chardin says the next evolution will not, the next step in an evolution or leap in evolution will not be physical, it will be social. So all of this changes the way we understand ourselves as human beings, and also then changes the way we are in, related with each other, with you know, our place in the natural world and our relationship with God. So when Lynn White and the Holy Father says, we need a new way of understanding our religion, that is the challenge for theologians. It would be interesting to find out how many of you have ever heard a homily preach about our responsibility to the natural world. A homily preached on ecology or envi environmentalism. There are some things we just don't preach about. We don't preach about that. Well, we shouldn't, you know, there's certain sexual things we don't preach about either. But to call, I mean, how else are people going to know how to understand these new insights in science. And I mean, how many parishes study the documents from the Holy Father? Now, I understand you do, you're, you're fortunate. If you have an opportunity within your parish to study this document, you are rare birds, I wanna tell you. Because many pastors are not aware of it. They have other things to do. 
And part of it has to do with the demands that are put on people in Paris today. But still, the, the purpose, you know, the, the church has a serious responsibility, and we as members of the church have serious responsibilities to learn. So as I said last night, and I feel very strongly about this, the real core of this whole problem, of this whole problem that the Holy Father is talking about, the depletion of natural resources, the problem has to do with the way we understand what we are as human beings and what is our place in this universe. And that's, you know, as the Holy Father refers to it, but that's anthropocentrism. And again, I'm going to go back. He always uses it with a negative adjective. And not because the anthropocentrism is bad, but it is, it is radical anthropocentrism. It is negative anthropocentrism that is operative in the world. So last night I tried to show you can't say, well, God created us in God's image and gave us the right to subdue and have dominion. It's a wrong reading of that text. Let me tell you this. If you're clever, you can pretty much make the Bible say and mean anything you want. Let me give you an example. I want to take two biblical passages we've all heard that we may know what they mean and put them together and it's an entirely different meaning. One of them is Judas went out and hung himself. Go and do thou likewise. Now those are two biblical passages. You put them together and you got a curse. Right? So we can, you know, if you're clever, you know, and, and by that I mean you either read into the text or, you know, you leave, you don't read out of the text. You don't read what's in the text. And another example that I gave you last night was the whole idea, you will not find, you will not find the word soul in the Hebrew Old Testament. You'll find it in the Greek Old Testament. The Septuagint, you will not find it in the Hebrew Old Testament because it's not a Hebrew word, All right? And if if it is in you know in there, it is an interpretation. Diane, could you repeat the word because for us uh, it went out for a second. We will not find the word soul, S O U, oh. in the Old Testament. All right, because that's a Greek. It's a Greek concept. All right. Uh, and and it, in the, in the account where it says that God created the man, formed the man out of the dust of the earth, and blew into him not a soul, blew in, into him the breath of life. And the breath of life is not the soul. That's something entirely different. Now sometimes we put them together and interpret it, and I'm not finding fault with doing it. Just don't say that's what's in the text because it's not in the text. It's some other place, and it's 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 not a bad interpretation, you know, a, a you know, of a soul. But then you have to realize that word is not in the Old Testament. It's not in the biblical text. All right, I want to uh, tell you uh, another passage, uh, or actually, it's not a passage; it's a whole book that gives us a very interesting insight into what, how the Bible understands what it means to be a human being. And that's the book of Job. Now, many people know about the patience of Job. Even non-believers talk about the patience of Job. The book of Job has 42 chapters. Job is patient in the first two chapters and the last 11 verses of chapter 42 but he's not patient from chapter three on. Job shakes his fist at heaven. He makes demands of God. Where were you when I needed you? How's that for a prayer? The patience of Job, no, he was not patient. He was an angry man. He was a crushed man. The whole question, the first two chapters present Job as a extraordinarily righteous man, more righteous than anyone else in his circumstances. 
and the, the author of the story does that. So we see how un, incongruous Job's suffering is because the people of the Old Testament, like us today, think that suffering is a punishment for sin. And as sophisticated as you may be in your spirituality, I'd be willing to bet that there has come many times, or at least sometimes in your life, where either you or somebody that you know asked the question, what did I do to deserve this? And whenever you ask that question or think that way, what you're saying is, you are responsible for your suffering. Now, sometimes that's true. If you eat the wrong food on purpose, you know you shouldn't eat it. You drink too much. I mean, our bad habits, sometimes we bring it on ourselves, but not all the time. Not all the time. There's some suffering we don't bring on ourselves. And then we ask, why? Why? And then we search for religious answers. And the first one that comes to mind is, you brought it on yourself. The good will be rewarded. The evil will be punished. If you're experiencing something that is unfortunate and, and painful, you're being punished for some evil that you've done. We never question that. That's retribution. We never question, you know, when, when we're being blessed. But we frequently question when something goes wrong and what we think is, what, what's the connection? What did I do wrong? So in the book of Job, the first two chapters present him as a highly righteous man. Because it's important to show that his behavior, his actions, his, his lifestyle in no way brings on suffering or should bring on suffering. So beginning with chapter three, what does Job do? He curses the day of his birth. You think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the way he curses the day of his birth is, is close to blasphemy as one could be. Actually, he, he, he curses the night of his conception. And what he wants is that the day becomes a night. He wants the order in the universe to be overthrown. Let, that, let the day of my birth become night. Now you gotta know, you gotta remember, I talked about this last night. You gotta remember ancient Israel's understanding of chaos and that the powers of good and the powers of evil are always fighting. And sometimes the powers of evil, at least in the Old Testament, is chaotic waters. Almost universally the, in the world, in different cultures, the powers of evil are referred to as darkness. Darkness is evil. That's, that, that's a universal symbol in, in almost all cultures in the world. And it's not just primitive. I mean, I remember you know, as a kid, you know, it, 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 in the cowboy movies, the hero was frequently dressed in white, but the ga bad guy was always in black. Sometimes he wore a black mask, but he always black. You, you can pick him out right away. You can pick out who's bad because he's dressed in black. You can, the Lone Ranger always wore white. Always wore white. And rode a white horse. I mean, all of that is symbolic of good and evil. So what we have here, night is evil, day is good. You got the struggle between the forces of evil. So what is Job praying for? He is praying that night, which is, is the symbol of evil, overcomes day. He's asking that evil overcome good. That's what he's asking for. He's asking if you, and now, if you want to do it, when we talk about theology, he is asking for the God of evil to overcome the God of good. That's blasphemy. In our language today, it would be like saying to God, go to hell. Because that would mean that goodness 
has been consumed by evil. That's what Job is asking for. You know, so in, the, in a very real sense, you know, and, and why is he asking? Because his life has been turned upside down. His experience of life does not fit what's going on. His real experience of life. And beginning with, well, chapter three is all Job con, you know, condemning. Then come his three visitors. Frequently people say his three friends. And I think these are, who needs friends like this? These are people who consistently point out you have done it yourself. God does not act that. God does not punish the righteous. So if you feel you're being punished, it is a hidden sin. Admit your sin. And constantly, if you read carefully what his visitors are saying, they are, they are constantly defending God. God doesn't act that way. And Job is saying, look at my life. God certainly is acting that way. It's punishing an innocent man. What have I done to deserve this? So they say something, Job says this. And they all say the same thing. They all say, you know, admit your guilt. And Job constantly says, I'm not guilty. Now, I'm, I've done some things wrong. I'm not this bad. And then after cycles of this going on, where one person speaks and Job responds, the next person speaks and Job responds over and over and over again until Job finally says, that's the end. And then he turns to heaven and says, answer, give an account of yourself. Now, that's pretty gutsy. That's what our Jewish friends would refer to as chutzpah, that we would have the gall to talk to God like that. But Job does. And then what happens? Be careful. Everything Job is struggling with and everything that Job talks about is justice and human suffering. So God begins to speak. And what does God do? He talks about nature. And when God speaks, he never says one word about Job's suffering. Not one word. And he never says anything about justice. What he says is, where were you when I created the universe? Do you know how it works? Can you control it? Can you do this? Can you do that? Do you even understand it? A whole series of rhetorical questions, which if Job would answer the questions, he would have to say, I don't know. I don't understand and I cannot control it. So he has to admit human limitation. In this universe, I am not in control. Right? And all God does, God does not find fault with you. All he does is ask him questions like a good teacher. A good teacher will form the question in such a way that students can answer it. A good teacher does not try to point out how the students don't know what's going on. A good teacher ha has a good question. Educari means to draw out, not to pour in, not to necessarily give all of the information. It means to draw out. So there's a whole set of questions about the universe. And then there's a next whole set of questions about animals. Animals which, at this time in Israel's history, Israel had no control over them. So if you can't control it in, in the mind, you know, of the radical anthropocentric person, if I can't control it, it has no value. It only has value if it can serve me. And if you can't control it, it has no value. Even the horse, it was an undomesticated horse at that particular time in history. So all that God points out is, is, first of all, the cosmos, but then God, I mean, Job's place of habitation, Job's earth where he lives. There are animals you can't control. Who do you think you are? Now, I, I want to read Job's final response. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have had it open, but I didn't. 
But Job's final response is magnificent. Because remember what Job is doing. Okay, this is 41. Um, Job is, Job, Job's real concern is, why is this happening to me? That's what Job wants to know. He, he, in no way does he say, no place in Job's, in Job's uh, in the, uh, dialogue or the monologue that Job say, take this away from me. He never asked to have it taken away, which I think is quite significant. But he always asks, why have you done this to me? Give me an answer of why. And he never gets one. God never tells him why. All God points out is, you wouldn't understand. You can't control it. And this is Job's response to that. I know that you can do all things. This is 42. I know that you can do all things. Job never questioned God's power. <laughs> I mean, Job's suffering is evidence of God's power. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be hindered. I have spoken, but did not understand. Things too marvelous for me, which I did not know. I will not question you. Or I'm sorry, I will question you and you will tell me. By heaven, I have heard of you. By hearsay, I mean, I have heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. No place in the text does it say that Job saw God. So that's simply a metaphor I have had an experience with you. Job experienced God. He heard him. He heard God. Therefore, I disown what I have said, and I repent in dust and ashes. Now, earlier Job said to God, I should put my hand over my mouth. We do that all the time. It's a way of saying I should keep my mouth shut. I should not have asked those questions. But why not? Who wouldn't? I mean, the question is, what have I done to deserve this? Or why has this happened to me? You want to hear that question? Go to funerals. Go to wake services. Try to, to console people and answer their question. Why has this happened? And be careful what you say. I remember years ago, a very good friends of mine, their two-year-old daughter died of an inoperable tumor. And at the wake of the two-year-old, they had a wake. At the wake of the two-year-old, Sandy said, I cannot tell you how many people I have had to console. Because people came up and said, God has another angel in heaven. You tell that to a mother who has just lost a child, that may not endear God to them. But we don't know what to say. Why do we think we have to say something? We think we have to have an answer. God did not give Job an answer. I disown what I have said. I take it back. I was wrong. He said that a couple of times. I was wrong to challenge what has happened to me. I was wrong to wonder why should I, you know, why should this happen to me? And then he says this, which is so important. I, I repent in dust and ashes. Dust and ashes is the metaphor that points to the most vulnerable reality of human existence. It refers to death. And death is the ultimate experience of human limitation. So the whole thing about Job, or at least the, the resolution, because Job, Job's dilemma has been resolved, but without an answer. Because he submitted himself acknowledging human limitation, ultimate human limitation. And he used the metaphor, the ultimate metaphor of human limitation. 
And, and, and what's the issue in the book of Job? There is so much about the universe, whether that be the cosmos or nature, we do not understand and we will not be able to control. That's what God brought Job to see. How did that resolve Job's dilemma? He came to the insight. There's much about the universe outside of me. I will never understand and I will never control. And there's much about nature within me, which means human nature. There's much about human life and human experience that I will never understand and I will never control because I am not the one that's running the show. That's the ultimate acknowledgement of human limitation. So we looked at image of God, image of God, not God, human limitation. And we look at Job. And whenever I teach this book, I always say to my students, don't ever forget, Job's dilemma was resolved. That passage, his response is in chapter uh, 42. His response shows it was resolved. He said, I, I take it back. It was resolved, but not with an answer to his question. Then how could it be resolved? An acknowledgement of human limitation. Now, what are the religious implications of an acknowledgement of human limitation? The book of Job is a religious book. The book of Job is not simply, you know, classical literature, though it is that, but it's a religious book. Which means that there is a religious answer. Acknowledgement of human limitation is not necessarily a religious answer. It can be because we stand before God as limited human beings. But you don't have to be a believer to acknowledge human limitation. And I want to say one way of understanding this acknowledgement from a religious point of view is this. We are not in charge. We believe that God is. Certainly with all of the questions that God posed, and it was God who was posing the questions, the implication was, you don't know what I know. You can't control what I can control. Okay, now there's where the religious, and that's in the book. It's very clearly in the book. And that's not just, you know, anthropological insight. That you can't control maybe, but I, the fact that you can control, but God can, that's religious. For us then, the question is, can you and I trust a God who is in control of everything, but does not let us in on the secret. That's the question. That's the profound religious question of the book of Job. Human limitation in the face of the immensity of God's splendor. Can you trust a God who does not let you or us, or me, in on the secret of what life is all about. And I want to say, and this is my, you don't have to agree. I want to say from my point of view, what's the alternative? What else can we do? And we know intellectually there is no other alternative but to trust in God. But we also know from experience it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. Because we really want God to step in. At least I know there are times when I wish God would simply step in and clean it up. I remember one time recently, I had been watching national news. And I, I said this out loud as a prayer. Where is their happiness in this world? And the prayer was, why do you have to make it so hard? 
a very simple prayer, a prayer of faith, acknowledging that God is in charge, and also an acknowledgement of human limitation. It is so hard to be a human being. At least I find it hard sometimes. All right, so, so this whole document, going back to uh, Laudato Si, is all about what does it mean to be part of this natural world? Well, both of those passages that I spoke about, one last minute, one today, speaks about the fundamental thing is we are limited. We are not in charge. We, and and the, the second one that the Holy Father talks about constantly is interconnectedness. Interconnectedness. I refer to that simply at the beginning when I talk about my relationship with my hand. Is that good language to talk about? You know, and I don't even know what to say. Is that good language to talk about how my hand is part of me? Is it a relationship or is it part of me? I used to think that Francis of Assisi was a strange little man who had a very artistic, creative sense of spirituality. And then I became conscious of cosmology and I realized this is not a strange, well, it could be strange, but this is, I mean, this is not poetic. This man had an insight into our relationship with animals in this world. And the relationship fundamentally begins with, as we find in the story in Genesis 2. Genesis 2, the creation of man. Not, not the Genesis 1 creation narrative, the second creation narrative. Very interesting. Very interesting. This begins uh, Genesis 2, uh, and it begins um, the, story of the, uh, the story of the heavens and the earth. No, wrong, wrong verse, I'm sorry. Yes, here it is. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. If you look at Genesis 1, creation is of the heavens and the earth, because that's where it starts. If you look at Genesis 2, God speaks about the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, there was, so already it's made, but there's no field shrub on earth and no grass of the field that sprouted. So it's barren. It's a barren earth. Why? Why is it barren? Notice it's an entirely different kind of story probably comes from an entirely different people. Most people think that Genesis 1 really rec represents hierarchy or monarchy because male and female, the, the royalty are the ones who have dominion over the earth. But Genesis 2 clearly came from agricultural people. I mean, different people have different stories. One of my favorite creation stories is the Plains Indian. It's a beautiful story. I want to just step away from the Bible and tell you that story creation story. Two corn stalks were laid down side by side. Why corn? Have you ever been to the plains? It's all corn. Lots of it is wheat, but there's corn. Fields of corn. Two corn stalks were laid side by side and covered with a blanket. It's plains Indian story. And then the great spirit came and pushed through the great plains. And where does that come from? Once again, have you ever been to the great plains? Right? So the, the, their stories reflect their experience. So the great spirit blew over and blew off the, the blanket. And now there was a man and a woman. And the traces of the great spirit are found on the tips of their fingers. I think that is so beautiful. It says so much. It says these people are people of earth. They are from where they come from. And yet some great spirit, however you want to understand that, call it the Holy Spirit, but they take an image of their experience, the wind in the plains and sweeping over them and transforming them. And traces of our creation are on our fingertips. And, and they tell us not even identical twins have the same fingertips, finger uh, prints. Nobody has fingerprints like I do or you do. 
it's the mystery of in individuality. <clears throat> so it's a beautiful story, and it comes from the Great Plains, just as this comes from agricultural people. So why was it? For the Lord had not sent rain upon the earth. God sends the rain, and there was no man to till the soil. So the earth will be fertile when God does what God is supposed to do and human beings do what human beings are supposed to do. And the word is ha-adam, ha-adam, the man. But the stream was welling up out of the earth and seeing all the, and, and, um, uh, watering all the face of the, of the ground. I can't see because I don't have a light on. Sorry, I'm going to have to turn the light on. All right. And then the Lord God for see you can't see me now. Then the Lord God formed Ha Adam, the man, out of the dust of the ground. And the man became a living being. Okay, so the man is made out of the dust of the ground. But the man is not the only creature that is made out of the dust of the ground. What I read was um, verse. Uh, verse uh, seven. If you go down to verse um, nineteen, no, and the Lord when, when it says when it says that God, it, it's not good for the man to be alone. The Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals. So the wild animals are formed out of the ground. I missed verse nine. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow, uh, the, made the trees to grow. So the the Genesis story tells us, and these are traditional people. Some would say they are ancient. They are primitive people. They're ancient people, but they're not primitive. They're not dumb. What comes out of the ground? The man is made out of the ground. The trees are made out of the same stuff. They are made out of the ground, and the animals are made out of the ground. In other words, there is a natural interconnectedness. There's a natural interconnectedness physically between you and me. And not because you hear my voice. I mean physically. We, can we could live off of each other's blood. There would be somebody, we get, we get blood transfusions. I don't know if I've ever had one. But we could, get, we could live off of somebody else's blood. We can live off of somebody else's organs. Why? Because we're made of the same stuff. We're made of the same stuff, okay? We're made of the same stuff, says our ancients. There is an intimate connectedness between us and, and life on earth. When the Holy Father talks about that interconnectedness, you can't get more basic than what you're made of. And also, we should not be surprised. We eat it. We eat the fruit of the trees. Why? It's the same stuff. We turned it into ourselves. And that, I think, is magic. I mean, when we think about taking food, digesting food, our bodies transform it into us. Sometimes a lot of us. Right? But our bodies do that. And why? Because, it, you know, we're made of the same stuff. It's shaped in different ways, but we're made of the same stuff as the trees. We're made of the same stuff as the animals. And like them, we decay and go back to earth. So there is an intimate relationship. There is also a social relationship between you and me. There, I don't understand it, but there's a social relationship between us and our pets. Okay? I mean, every once in a while, you'll see something you know, on television, um, a soldier comes home having been gone for three years and by God, the dog recognizes him. How? The dog immediately runs. How? There's some kind of, a, and as I say, I don't understand the connection, but there, and I don't have to, there's some kind of a connection. There. Of course, dogs have memory. We know dogs, dogs have memory. If dogs didn't have memory, Lassie would never have come home. He wouldn't know how. 
Okay, so uh, and those are all things we know, but we don't always think about what they mean. Right, and we become attached to them, dying when I mean crying when they die. Not I mean, there's a whole you know department of grief cards, sympathy cards for having lost your dog or having lost your cat. And some would say that, I mean, that really is a little odd. But it says something about an emotional connection. And the dog has some kind of a connection with us as well. So there is this kind of interconnectedness. But unfortunately, uh, friends, it is because of the, of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment did wonderful things. The Enlightenment, a period of, of, at least in the West, a period of, of intense uh, investigation and discovering how things work. We learned how to take the world apart. We didn't always learn how to put it back together. All right? Because we began to see things in the world as specimens of what we can conquer and how we can use it. How, can, how we can use it. Again, I don't know if you, you know, you, uh, you've ever read The Velveteen Rabbit, which is one of those children's books that's not a children's book. But it's all about a rabbit that was loved so much, all of the hair, the whiskers were rubbed off. But then at the, well, I'll tell you the end of the book, which I never should, but I started. At the end of the book, the rabbit becomes a real rabbit because it was loved. Now that's a lovely little story for children, but it's more than a story for children. I mean, the things we are attached to, we love deeply. What is that attachment? How do you describe that attachment? We frequently have an attachment to things, not just living things, dead things. I remember when my father died for two years, my mother kept his toothbrush in the, the rack in the, in the bathroom. For two years, she kept his toothbrush. Took her two years to be able to part from a toothbrush, but it was his. Right? So we, we, do, we do become attached to things. There's something within us that we are attached to things around us. What we have to learn to do is broaden that and realize our interconnectedness. Another biblical story that, that demonstrates that interconnectedness, believe it or not, is the story of what happened after the flood. And this is in Genesis 9. In Genesis 9, after the flood, the flood God made a covenant with Noah, a covenant. It's a legal term. It's also a religious term because, because you know, they're, they're, all of their laws were not only secular laws, but they were religious laws. But with who did God make the covenant? Just listen. God, first of all, you got to realize there's the patriarchal society, and it's also patrilineal. Patrilineal means you inherit through the line of the father. There are certain societies that are patriarchal. Archal means the arche, the head has got to be a, a patros, a father. That's what the word means. Patrilineal means the line is the line of the father. But there are matrilineal lines, which means you can inherit through your mother and you still have a patriarchal society. Ancient Israel was patriarchal. That was the structure. In the ancient Near Eastern world, it was patriarchal. And it was patrilineal. That's why they wanted sons. It had nothing to do with testosterone. And they needed a son in order to keep the inheritance in the family because you inherited through the line of the father. That's why they needed a son. Because if you had no son, then your inheritance went laterally to your brother and his son, and you lost, you know, you lost everything. Okay, so. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fertile and multiply and fill the earth. Sounds like Genesis 1. 
fear and dread of you shall come upon all the animals of the earth and all the birds of the air and upon the en- and the creatures that are above and the creatures are in the fish in the sea. Sounds like Genesis 1. All right. We go on. And the Lord said to Noah and his sons, I am now establishing my covenant with you and your descendants, which means this covenant is generational. So it's not just Noah and his sons. It's generation after generation after generation. And one will say women, the feminist will say, where are the women? And that kind of a society, women benefit from society through the men. First, your father. Then you benefit from society through your brother. If you're, when your father dies. When you marry, through your husband. When your husband dies, through your son. I happen to think that the reason that Jesus on the cross gave Mary to the care of John had very little to do with devotion. It had to do with the social structure. Because she was a widow and her son, her only son dies. How does she benefit from the social structure? I hope I have not destroyed your devotion. We can add devotion to that. But there was something structural in that. All right. So your descendants after you. And not just human beings. With every living creature that was with you. The birds. The tame animals. And all the wild animals that were with you in uh, in the ark. I establish my covenant with you. That never again shall creatures be destroyed by the waters of the flood. Notice the chaotic waters. Never again. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I'm making between you and all the living creatures. And all the way through this, it's you and all of nature. The covenant, the very first covenant that God made was with the natural world, not with human beings. That's what our religious ancestors thought. Because the relationship with nature, of which we are a part, our embeddedness in nature, is the most fundamental. It's much more fundamental than marriage. It's much more fundamental than anything else. It is fundamental to everything. Our participation in the natural world. We have a significant role. What we've got to do, and the Holy Father says this over and over again, We need a new way of understanding our role in the natural world. Now, there are two major themes that I've been talking about. One of them is, once again, what does it mean to be a human being? How do we understand anthropocentrism? Are we guilty of being radically anthropocentric? Now, I don't think any one of us can say no. I think we all are. I think within our culture, we are so caught in that sometimes we don't even realize when we are being anthropocentric. Thinking, I'm in charge. It is the way, I mean, how much garbage do you throw away? And why can hungry people go into garbage cans and find food that we have thrown away and they can survive on it? Why do we throw it away? There is one word that is fundamental to what I'm talking about. And that word is more. More. We always want more. Our whole function of life in society, not just capitalism. We've got capitalism, but other economic systems as well. More. It's based on more. How much does the human being need? How many pair of shoes does one human being need? 
How many change of clothing do you need? Do I need? We should struggle with those questions. Because if we don't, then we don't realize how embedded we are in using what we don't need. Throwing away what we don't need. We don't know how to use up. We don't know how to look at things and say, well, I want to tell you. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, and, and I'm not patting myself on the back. But, you know, I, I brought my mail, picked my mail up, put it on my office, on my desk, you know, before we began this evening. And one of them was a, a catalog. Where do they get your name? I get catalogs from places I've never purchased anything, but they got your name. So I'm looking through, and it's women's clothing, of course. They're not going to send me a catalog of men's clothing. I mean, when I say, where do you get their names? I know where they get my name. All right, so I'm pacing through that, and I'm thinking, hey, I like that. And then I was, thank you, Jesus. I thought to myself, you don't need it, Diane. But I like it. And I would like it, piece of clothing. And I realized, I don't need it. And if, we, if I don't need it, I want to tell you, not just clothing. If I don't need it, I have come to the point where I like to say, though I'm not always faithful, if I don't need it, I have no right to have it. All right. So the whole question is, you know, what is our role? What is our place in the natural world? Connected with that is the idea of interconnectedness. We are interconnected with the rest of the natural world. We are made of the same stuff. We breathe its air. We eat its food. We drink its water. And the reason we can is because it's made of the same stuff as we are. And that's why we can turn it into ourselves. All right. Questions, comments, observations. Think for a moment. Think of them. Think of those things. There's always room for improvement. Always room for improvement. Anyone, any comments, observations, or questions? Yeah, yes, Father. No, raise your, I was just going to say, raise your hand and then I can unmute you or. You can unmute yourself, but that way we'll have a little bit more order and I'll do it in order. Those of you who are on the beach in Edgewater right now, like the McCormicks, just throw a fish out of the water or <laughs> so that we know you have your question or bring their picture back. Doug, K. Vincent, welcome to you guys. But anyone have a question or a comment? Uh, Angie? Hi. So I'm fascinated by this uh, in terms of learning and listening. And I'm wondering, um, besides the encyclical letter, like where is us like to start learning more about this? Uh, resources, uh, I'm, and I'm, forgive me, I missed last night's uh, introduction. So if you shared some resources last night, um, I'd be curious to, to hear about that. Well, what you have to do is get the name of the document. Once you get the name of the document, all you got to do is Google. Google will come up with it. Okay. You can also have, let's say, um, uh, worksheets or, or studying the, you know, the, the name of the document. And then there are two names. One of them, uh, well, uh, this one uh, is a Latin because it was written uh, uh, in Latin. So it's a Latin, doc, a Latin name, and the name is always the first words of the document, but it always has the English translation, so you can do it with either name. And th there are wonderful study guides, you can get that, and, you know, and one could, you know, can study with a group or study with oneself. But if the Francis document, if it's a document of the current Pope, he writes, he writes it. I, you know, he doesn't have a, uh, you know, a document writer. He writes it, and he writes it in, in language you can understand. So many Vatican documents are written in language that is frequently referred to as Vaticanese, 
All right, now Gail is holding up something. I don't know if you can can you read it. She's holding up the document. You can get our, 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 our the which... document in book form. You can get it in book form. You can also simply get it right off the web if you want. You know, and and all right now, Gail, are there? You'll have to unmute yourself. Are there study guides in that in that booklet that you have? I don't know if that one does. No, yeah. no. But ones, and Angie, the other thing just to note, like Francis loves to footnote resources. And his mm -hmm. footnotes are kind of research papers or studies in themselves that really help you unpack the documents. But online, there are tons of uh, books like what Gail showed. Right. Which yes. You can find all kinds of discussion questions online as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the piece that I struggle with. Uh, I'm a crib notes person, like give me a, a snapshot of it so that I can go from there. And when I pull up the encyclical yeah. and start to, I, it gets overwhelming. Yeah. So I was like curious as to like an approach to. You do that. You, there, there, are, there are those, I don't think they're called crib notes, but what are they? Uh, concise, you know, concise oh. insight is what they're called. Mm -hmm. So you can find that. I think if you go Google, um, uh, you'll have all of the different, uh, if you Google the document's name, you'll have all different possibilities. Yeah, and, and, and Gail's also showing us, this is the USCCB uh, website. That, right. that this, this resource is available from Washington, D.C. and supports the Church of the United States. Yeah. Right. And they would have questions and discussion um, uh, and synopses or, you know, uh, notes uh, to right. summarize this. Stuff. Exactly, yeah. I know also the Franciscans have what have you know have a, um, a, a outline that they use as well. Anyone else? Any questions or observations or comments? I'm sorry. George, did you have a question? You just got to. Any questions? I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. Uh, I, I, when you were talking about um, getting catalogs and things you don't need, yeah. um, I mean, it seems to me that that's not a, I mean, it is certainly correct to say that probably 90 plus percent of, of everything we purchase or acquire in any way is, is things we don't need in a practical sense, right? I mean, we don't need them to breathe or to, to survive. I mean, even... Right. Even the food, even the food we buy, like you say, how much of it is is stuff we throw away or we don't need. But uh, how do we deal with the emotional, not the practical, but the sort of the? I mean, there's a there's an emotional benefit, I would argue, to buying that new pair of shoes, right? Or to buying uh, a new golf club or thing. I mean, I don't need a new golf club, Lord knows. But you know, we do that and we get sort of a psychic, um, emotional, psychological, um, I would say benefit, although that may be, I mean, uh, and your story about your, your mom keeping your dad's toothbrush, there's certainly no practical benefit to her keeping that, right? I mean, she's not gonna use it uh, to, to brush her teeth, but how do, we, how do we balance or how do we deal with, you know, it thinks not so much from a practical perspective, but from an emotional or psychological. Right. Your, your question has a very easy answer. I don't know. No, I mean, I said that facetiously, but I mean it really. I think every one of us has, and first of all, you can get squirrely with this. I mean, you know, strictly speaking, if you want to say, I don't need this, I don't need this, I mean, you know, you're, you're not going to have anything. And I'm, you know, that's an extreme. And some people, some people are called to do, to live an extreme poverty kind of life, you know, or at least they believe that they're called to live that way. Um, uh, I think I, I can only speak for myself. And I know why I said that. I mean, I, you know, at, at, um, why I said I've reached the point in many ways, if I don't need it, I have no right to it, right? Um, the question is, what do I need? Do I need a computer? Yes, I need a computer. That is no luxury, all right? 
Um, do I need, you know, there are certain things that I know I need. Uh, do I need the best computer that I, you know, well, I, 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 it will not help me given what I, what I do with the, my computer is my world. All right. In a certain sense, and not because of Zoom, but because I'm an author as well. And I need, I need a computer in order to do what I'm doing. And it's got to be a good computer. It's got to, it can't break down all the time, which means I, I probably should not get the cheapest one. But to, it, so one has to make those decisions oneself. And, and also, um, I'm a vowed religious. I took a vow of poverty. It was very easy to live a poverty when I knew exactly what I needed, when I wore a habit. I wore a habit. And I knew how many changes of clothing. So it was easy to, to live the vow of poverty. Because, I mean, I had three habits. We had the Sunday habit. We had the weekday habit. We had the Saturday habit. You know, and eventually they just work their way down. You get a new Sunday habit, all right? All right, and, and, but you meet it yourself, of course, all right? So in a certain sense, I mean, for me to say, if I don't need it, I have no right to it. I'm saying that as a vowed religious, and I'm not asking anybody else to do that. And I also want to say, I've only thought that way within the recent past. So that's something that I've come to, and it may be part of my age as well. And, and when my mother died, I am the one that took the house apart. I had a very good friend who died. I am the one that took that house apart. And I remember making up my mind and saying, I was happy to do it. It was an honor, but no one's going to do that for me. I'm going to get rid of my stuff before I die. So nobody will throw away what I value. And if I value it, I will give it to somebody that I value and tell you, tell them, you know, so, but that's me. So it may be part of, of my, I, I mean, look at me. I'm not 42, believe it or not. <laughs> I haven't been 42 in a long time. Why do I have to buy all these things? So part of it has to do with one's age. And where one is in one's life journey, if you want to say that. But I still feel very strongly from an ecological point of view. I think every one of us has really got to ask, really, do I need this? Do I have, you know, and, and in a certain sense, because we have the money and we bought it, we think we have a right to it. Well, do we really? Is it really ours? And I realize that that's the kind of, of a mentality that comes from a certain kind of spirituality. And I'm not apologizing for it. But I'm saying that's mine. That's how I struggle with what it means to be faithful to the world of which I am a part. Every one of us has got to come to it. How you do it. I, 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 I've never had children, all right? So consequently, I don't have to have a lot of stuff that you need when you have children. And I, I'm, I'm quite sure, I, I also know there are times when I maybe throw away things I, or give away things I shouldn't. And then I, you know, I go, oh God. Well, obviously there was, you know, I, at the moment I thought I didn't need it. Okay, but that's, that's my way, I, I, you know, of paring down or downsizing or whatever you want. All right, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, a full-time teacher anymore. So I had, I had, you think, you think, uh, uh, JT's got a, a large library. That was nothing compared to mine. But I don't, I didn't use the books anymore because I wasn't teaching all those classes. So then my question is, if I don't know, need the books, what am I going to do with them? So I gave them to the next person who took my place being the Old Testament professor because I didn't need them anymore. And I think, again, I mean, it has to do with the lifestyle that I professed, you know, long time ago. And it also has to do with my age. And I think every one of us has got to come to and ask yourself that question. What does it mean to be a human being in the world in which we are? And I'm, and I'm saying nothing about, you know, of us having more than people who live on the street. That's an entirely different question that we haven't even touched on. But the question is in terms of using the goods of earth, 
using them. We store it up in different places. Some of us store it up in our, you know, in the way we take care of our body. Some of us store up the things in the closet. There was, a, and it was a, a religious woman, you know, she, she said, oh God, I got so much stuff in my bedroom, it's not funny. Now, what would you, what response? What should she do then? What kind of advice would one give? And I'm, I'm not, I didn't give any advice. I just said, oh, so how did she deal with it? She got a two bedroom apartment. You know, and you can laugh, but how many of you store things someplace else? Have, you know, one of these, you know, drive-in storerooms, you know? And, and, I, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, you know, be careful what you laugh at. And, and I say that because I'm like you, I'm struggling through it. So you know, how do you do it? I don't know how to do it. I know how I'm, I'm, I know how I feel I should do it. I don't know. I have no advice to give to you except think about what you need. That is an ecological question. It's not just a social question with poverty. It's also an ecological question. And it's not just for saving money. Because sometimes the best ecological or environmental decision costs more money. And, and people sometimes say, in the long run, you get the money back. Notice it's always money. No, in the long run, you're doing the right thing. Putting in solar panels. I've never understood how come we have never learned how to put a solar panel on the roof of a car? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, that as we're driving down the highway, we got a solar panel and it's, you know, it's, it's converting it into electricity to drive the car. You know, and of course we know the answer. The fossil fuel world fights that tooth and nail. And not because it puts them out of work. It does, but they don't want to change because there'll always be so much more work in another, fi another field of occupation. So I don't know what to tell you, except I share with you how I struggle with it. That, that's my struggle. And I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying, you know, knowing who I am, that's how I'm dealing with it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Our time is way up. No, I think that's a good way for us to reflect on our own selves then and uh, to take that with us and sleep on it and look forward to tomorrow night. Good. Same time, same place, same Zoom channel. Wonderful. All right. Everyone have a good day. I Thank hope to see you tomorrow evening. Nice to be with you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you very much. God bless. And here ends the session. Yeah. God bless you all. Right.